West, and I'm an engineering manager on the Facebook team, and I'm at Luminance 2012. The most interesting thing to me about the future of photography is if you look at the graph of photos produced, it's very much an exponential curve. The things we're going to be able to do from a computational perspective with those photos to like really make moments in time and place a more visceral experience, I think it's going to be extraordinary. Good morning. My name's Corey West, and I'm an engineering manager at Facebook on the Photos team. There we go. Um, and I wanted to share with you today a little bit of my personal journey with social photography. Now, first a little bit about my background. So I've been in software and technology for about 20 years, and most of that time I've spent working on creative tools. I worked on the audio video pipelines in Windows, uh, I worked on Pro Tools, the audio software, and I worked on Avid's video editors. I worked at Adobe on experience design tools. And about six months ago, I joined Facebook to work on the Photos team. And as a hobbyist photographer, my background goes about the same duration, about 20 years. But I didn't really start to get serious about my interest in photography until about 10 years ago. And when I started to get serious about my interest in photography, the thing that I was most passionate about was shooting arts organizations, and particularly performing artists. And for me, the thing that really captured my attention about this genre is capturing the moment for a performer when they're completely immersed in performance. That there's something magical for me about being able to capture that experience as a viewer, as an observer, and then also being able to share that with them in particular, because it's not something as a performing artist you get to experience firsthand, but also with their friends. And for me, the pinnacle of my interest here was getting to work with the Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble for a couple of years, which I did, and these are some of the photos from that. And then about two years ago, I started to look for what's next for me in photography, like what's the thing I want to do next? And I knew it wanted to, I wanted it to involve people. Um, and at the same time in my life, I started to have, to notice an experience that I was having about memory, which is it seemed to be I was remembering fewer and fewer details, specific facts and details about my personal life, and my friends seemed to be remember, remembering fewer details of their lives as well. And since I'm a pretty diverse group of friends, this didn't seem to be uh, just people forgetting, like getting older, getting more busy, and forgetting things in their lives. So I got curious about this. I got curious about, first of all, were we really actually remembering fewer details of our lives? And was that really impacting our experience of our lives? Right? And so I started to get curious about this, and I started to think about what is the relationship between memory and quality of life? And I started first by looking at memory. Like, what is the experience of memory? What's the phenomenon of memory? So, what is memory and how does it work? Memory, fundamentally, is an experiential tool, right? So you remember something, and then you have the experience of having remembered it, or you have the experience of knowing it. The two things really go hand in hand. No memory, no experience. You can't experience something that you don't remember, at least fleetingly. Right? And the other thing to notice is memory has a capacity, right? So we don't have an infinite capacity for memory. We remember specific things rather than everything we've ever encountered or experienced. And we have strategies for making the most use of that capacity. Let me give you an example. How many of you remember whether or not you paid your rent or your mortgage this month, right? Right? Hopefully, hopefully a number of people, and that's because that's an important detail. Now let me ask another question. How many of you remember whether or not you signed that check in blue ink or black ink? Right? Maybe a few of you, but for the most part we're not going to remember that, right? Because we're, we're not predisposed to remember information that we deem unimportant. And in fact, we have a bunch of strategies for how to make most of our cognitive capacity, right? For how to make the most of our memory. So, some of these strategies, in fact, are evolutionarily biased. Like, we have wiring and machinery that informs how our memory works. So let me give you a much starker example. Who's familiar with the concept of a traumatic injection memory? Does anyone know about this phenomenon? So, in psychological research, a traumatic injection memory says, under times of great stress or great duress or trauma, we're going to be more likely to commit a vivid, detailed memory to mind and really hold on to that. Now, you would think, if you thought about that casually, you'd think, like, what would be the possible advantage of remembering a traumatic experience? 
right? Because that's gonna lead to more suffering and more unpleasantness. But from an evolutionary perspective, that wiring is there because if we happened across a traumatic experience, right? And we lived to tell about it, we wanna remember that. So we don't ever do that again, right? Or so we avoid that situation. So it turns out we have all sorts of optimization strategies. And more importantly, our optimization strategies adapt themselves to our environment, right? So your environment informs which optimization strategy you're gonna to apply to your memory to get the most out of it. Now, while I was thinking about this, I came across an article. And that article, is the Google effects on memory, right? Cognitive consequences of having information at our fingertips. Now, this article uh, documents research done by Daniel Wegner, professor of psychology at Harvard. And Dr. Wegner observes in some very clever studies that in populations of people that have highly reliable access to highly accurate databases of facts, that population exhibits a very specific adaptation strategy. That population will optimize its capacity by no longer remembering facts, and instead applying all of our cognitive experience to remembering how to find facts and where to get facts. Right? So this sort of makes sense. If you have every piece of information ever created available at your fingertips, you're going to stop worrying about where to get information. You're going to start thinking more about how to get the information you need quickly. What are, what are the strategies for finding what you need in the, in the quickest possible way? We've probably all had this experience, right? With facts, I'm on a need-to-know basis with facts. I landed in New York not having any idea where this building was. Right? And, and 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been true. I wouldn't have set foot on a plane without really knowing where I was going and where I needed to be. Um, Dr. Wegner says, we're becoming symbiotic with our computer tools. We're growing into interconnected systems that remember less to know more. Right? So this is interesting. To get the most out of knowing more, we remember less. Right? So that's a bit of an irony. So let me give a really specific example. Who here remembers a time before PDAs and smartphones? Right? Good. So let me ask a question. How many phone numbers did you know <laughs> by heart? How many? Who knew 10 phone numbers? Right? Anyone know 20 phone numbers by heart? A lot of people, right? How many, does, how many people don't remember how many phone numbers they knew? Right? <laughs> um, now, fast forward to today. How many phone numbers do you remember today? Is there anyone willing to say they're over five? OK, it's a smaller number. There are some folks who probably are below three. I'm actually in the zero club. If you took my phone away from me, I would have two options, 411 and 911. <laughs> That's it, right? So the irony is this. We can be in instant phone communication with more people than ever before. And we do this by not remembering phone numbers, or by remembering fewer phone numbers. Now, consider the experience of that. If you're going to call somebody, you have two potential experiences for calling somebody, right? You might recall their number from memory and dial the phone and have a conversation. And that's going to lead you to have a, a particular experience. Or you might look up someone's number and dial the number and call and talk to them on the phone. At the end of both of those experiences, you're talking to somebody on the phone, but you're going to have a particular experience with each one. Which experience is more personal? The first experience is more personal, right? In fact, remembering something about someone is a personal experience. We convey value to that. And consider the language we use. Now, this is particularly interesting to me. So, if you're having a conversation with somebody, and in that conversation you say, do you know my number? And you don't really know that person. It wouldn't be surprising at all for them to say, no, would you write it down for me? Or, no, I can look it up. Or, yes, I have it, it's written down at home. Right? That wouldn't be surprising at all. But if you were having this conversation with somebody that you were in an intimate relationship with, and they said, no, I don't know your number, you'd be dumbfounded. You might respond like, what do you mean you don't know my number? Another thing they might say, though, is they might say, I know it by heart. I know your number by heart. Right? Who said that, or some variation on that? Well, we don't store information in our heart. We store it in our brain. We all know that. Right? So why do we say this? We say this because we 
place that much value on our cognitive capacity that to remember a fact or a detail about someone actually is an expression of love. It's an expression of intimacy. That's the kind of value we place on memory. So let's look a little bit more at memory. If you go back in Dr. Wegner's research, and this is back in 1995, this paper, a computer network model of human transactive memory, that's a mouthful, basically in this paper, what Dr. Wegner does is he draws a comparison. He, he builds a simple model between how computers and network systems use memory and how people and collections use memory. And this is a bit of a model, but it's fascinating because what Dr. Wegner observes is something that's not intuitive until you think about it and then it's obvious. And that's that in any system of people, a small group or a work group, one of the optimization strategies we employ is we split up our information into silos or domains and we each take responsibility for mastering a domain and then we expand what we can access by knowing what we know and knowing who to ask to get other information, right? So it's a divide and conquer strategy. Um, and in an optimization like this, fundamentally getting information is a social phenomenon. I'm going to turn around because I can't read that monitor back there. So in particular, Dr. Wagner says, in any group, you're going to get this phenomenon. You're going to get this phenomenon of people dividing up information, siloing it, and then accessing it over their social network. It's a fundamentally social phenomenon. But like I said, this is... This is one of those things that's not intuitive until you think about it and then it becomes obvious. So let me give you a much, much simpler example. If you need to remember to get something at the store, right, and you don't have a pen and a paper, and your iPhone's completely run dead, what are you going to do? Right? One of the things you might do is you might take someone with you and ask them to remember something for you. Right? Don't let me forget to milk. Don't let me forget to call someone. Don't let me forget, remind me to... Like, this is language we always use, right? So this is the social phenomenon of information and memory. Okay, so here's the picture all this was starting to paint for me. We're leading very full lives, and we're making full use of our information resources to do that, right? And because you're in this room, this probably very much applies to you. You're making full use of your information resources and your fact databases to live a very rich life. And at the same time, that means necessarily you're adapting away from remembering specific facts and details and more towards remembering and knowing strategies for finding facts that are relevant to what you're looking for. And at the same time, because of how your information is stored, because of how all of our information is stored and accessed, we have fewer opportunities to traverse our social graph outside of explicitly social settings. Now, this is not to say that we're inundated with information and it's destroying our quality of lives. I don't believe that's true. And it's not to say we're less social because of computers, because I don't think that's true either. I think, in fact, we're more social because of computers. But what it's saying is we're adapting to not remembering facts, and we simply don't have as many opportunities to traverse our social network to find information. So, when that happens, you lose something, right? You lose something experientially and you lose something else. You lose the opportunity for secondary social cues to show up. And the secondary social cues in particular are things that convey relationship depth, right? Stored information about another person. Remember, we ascribe a personal value to that. That's an intimate act for us, even if it's the most mundane of information, it turns out. So, my inquiry, my personal inquiry, was what could be done to counteract some of this, right? I wanted all of the goodies, rich quality of life, and uh, I didn't want to lose the adaptation strategies. So about two years ago, I decided in a really purposeful way, I'd turn my camera towards my social events. And when I say purposeful way, I mean like photojournalistically. I had to retrain all of my friends to get used to this, um, but it was it was totally worth the effort, and they're completely retrained now. <laughs> <laughs> now, a couple caveats. So this isn't, from a research perspective, a rigorous study, right? Like, I'm not a psychology researcher. Um, so these are examples and anecdotes that I'm going to share. And uh, you're invited to draw your own conclusions, right? And I'll share with you my conclusions as well. 
Uh, and the other thing is, let's just get this out of the way. Of course I'm biased. I work for Facebook. I think sharing photos on Facebook is great. I think everyone should do it. Um, so, yes. <laughs> All right, so the photos. I chose a very specific set of photos to pull data from. And these are 27 distinct social events that I attended over the last 18 months. Now, I didn't pull any photos that are casual from my iPhone. I was out, I took a snapshot. I chose photos from events where I very specifically set out to document the full scope of the event and the full range of people that were there. And of those events, I took about 7,000 photographs, 7,000 shutter clicks, right, which is not actually that extraordinary for a, for a big shoot. And of those photographs, about 950 curated shots got posted to Facebook. Um, only my absolute favorites. And the photos I chose were ones not necessarily that were the technical best, that definitely was a bias, but they were ones that really captured the event and the range of emotions that happened in the event. Now, the response I got was a little surprising. Even when I pulled the numbers some weeks ago, I was actually a little surprised. 400 photos got responses. So the surprising thing for me is when I think of like snapshots of my random social events, I don't think of engagement on half of those. And there were about 880 incidents of participation broken down between comments and likes. This was more responses than I imagined, but there was something else surprising in the data. And I wanted to share this with you explicitly because I don't think it's intuitive until you actually see it. Here's a surprising thing. 55% um, of activity on my photos was from people I didn't know. 55%, more than half of the comments and likes on my photographs were from people I had never met and had no relationship with. And yet these were photographs of friends at social events. So I would have assumed like, you go to a dinner, you take pictures of people, the audience for your photos is your friends, but it turns out your friends of friends actually get a tremendous amount of value of seeing those photos. And when you think about it mathematically, it makes sense, right? So there's one of me, and I have hundreds of friends, and they each have hundreds of friends, and that's tens of thousands of friends in your second order friend of friend network. And like, to make it really specific, for me the number today is I have about 850 friends, and I have about 31,000 friends of friends. So when I really rigorously document an event and, and publish photos, that's, that's the potential audience. It's actually extraordinarily large. And then also what I noticed with social events is when I documented an event where I only knew some of the people, those photographs would actually get identified by those people radiating out so that everyone in the event eventually would be documented and it would go out to their friends. Okay, so I only have about a minute left and I'm gonna go pretty quickly. I wanted to show some photos. Now I have to really caveat these, right? You don't know the people in these photos, so it's really unlikely that you're gonna establish a significant emotional reaction to the photographs. This might be a little bit like my vacation slideshow, and I apologize for that. The other thing is I didn't choose photos based purely on quality. I chose them because they were highly active on Facebook and because in the comments of the photos, something showed up that made me think that I was in fact providing an opportunity to reestablish some of those secondary social cues, which remember is what this whole experiment was about. Can I make people more open and connected by documenting our social events? All right, so let's blast through these. Um, I love this photo. This is a photo of a woman named Jan doing dishes, and I took this photo the night I met her, and I put it up with the group, and she was tagged in it. Instantaneously, a number of her friends commented on the photo, people that didn't know me that I had never met, and the comment that jumped out at me in particular was this secondary social cue. Your smile lights up the world. That's appreciation and acknowledgement. So score one for social photography, right? Um, these people I know very well, and this was a dinner of four people at their house. Completely casual, not a big deal event, and I just happened to snap this moment and post it. What was interesting about this is not only were our mutual friends able to participate in the photo, but even distant friends of theirs that I didn't know. Um, I particularly love this photo because I think it really captures the essence of this particular person. Her name's Meredith, but why I chose it was because Meredith moved from New York to San Francisco, and then after a few years, she and her husband moved into a house, and this is from their housewarming party. And when I posted this photo, her friends from remote were able to reach out and just remind her that she was still in their thoughts, that they missed her, right? 
Um, another party photo. I didn't actually know these people uh, when I took the photo. Even more funny as it turns out, I work with one of them at Facebook. <laughs> uh, they were eventually tagged into the photo. Tremendous amount of activity from their friends on the photo, but also friends of friends using the photo as an opportunity to talk about other friends and other geographies and other distances, right? So the, the photo became a jumping off point for a whole other conversation of people I never met and don't know. Um, this photo is very dear to me, actually. These are my two best friends at their engagement party, and this was sort of the largest event I documented. It's an epic event. Um, and even so, it was just not possible for everyone to be there, right? And so I posted this photograph, extraordinary outpouring from across all of their friends, across all geographies. Cheers and good wishes. This photograph, um, and this is the last one, I promise. Uh, I chose this photograph in particular because when I snapped this photograph, I had no idea who this was. And the photograph went up with the set for the party and eventually got tagged in. An entire group of people I've never met jumped on and participated on it. Okay, I lied, there's one more. Uh, this is super important. I obviously didn't <laughs> take this photo. You're photographers, you're used to being on one particular side of the camera. Don't forget when you're taking social photographs to hand the camera to somebody else. Everyone loves to see a picture of the photographer, right? So really the question here is, is did all this effort make our lives better? Right? Did this actually move the needle on quality of life? I don't have any way to prove this, but for me, I'm gonna say absolutely. The fundamental experience of my life was different as a result of doing this. And all of my friends are completely acclimated to it now and they actually expect me to do it. They sort of demand that I bring the camera. So that, that is what it is. My invitation to you is find out for yourselves. Turn your cameras towards your friends because maybe in the information culture we're heading into, maybe in the experience of like having infinite information available to us all the time, what's gonna be important to really experiencing the full quality of life that we're gonna be able to extract from that is having really good photographs and sharing those photographs across our social networks, not only as a tool for like memory, but also a tool for communication. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, so first, I don't want you to think that I completely missed the point, but I noticed that the photos had some pretty buttery bokeh, so I was wondering what kind of camera you were using. Uh, the buttery ones were 5D Mark III with the 1.2 50mm, which I love. <laughs> yeah, great lens. The other one is uh, the NEX5 with the Voigtlander for pocket size. The way that you explained kind of the, the getting to your thesis had a very academic approach. Mm -hmm. When you guys are talking about developing the next feature in Facebook, et cetera, is there that academic approach that's going in talking about the value of social networks? Or are you also having the conversation about this is more time on site, this is more page views equals more ads? Really fundamentally, um, we're data-driven as a company, but data-driven from a product perspective. And, the, and what we're really trying to do is build the absolute best product that connects people, and makes the world more open, makes people more connected, fosters sharing, and our conversation is about building the right product almost exclusively. Now, we have to pay for it somehow, so I don't want to give you the wrong impression that we never pay any attention to like, how we're gonna you know, put the lights on, but one of the things that I most like about Facebook is we're rigorous about never having uh, paying the light bills be something that will detract from product quality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the decision recently with, uh, with the Facebook photos to go to larger uh, previews mm -hmm. and to go to a square format versus original aspect ratio, can you yes. talk a little bit about that decision? Square versus not square was like the debate of the century. Yeah. Uh, and clearly people have a, like tons of opinions about this. Um, I can't really recapture the full spirit of the debate because like it raged and there's still many, many camps. Ultimately, Square does something, right, in terms of presentation. Square lets you uh, completely fill the field of view um, and then you can offset some of the crop loss by allowing people to have a consistent position of photos. So we're sort of, we're sort of trying to tackle both problems while really optimizing for a nice layout, which is to say, we're doing square crops, but we're giving you a mechanism to position photos in that square, and then we're gonna try and honor that everywhere on the site. Right. And then other places where it's appropriate to have uncropped information, like in search, we'll actually revert back to an uncropped view. Thank you very much, Corey. Yeah.